Hello and welcome to a brand new season of Northwest Profiles. I'm Lynn Valtre, your host, and as you can see, as we begin our 32nd season, we've made some much needed changes, not only in the overall look and feel of the show, but our theme music as well. We hope you like it. While change is good, the one thing that hasn't changed, besides yours truly, is the mission of Northwest Profiles which is to share with our viewers a variety of engaging stories illuminating the best of what the Inland Northwest and Western Canada has to offer. So with that in mind, let's crack open the seal on this new season and get rolling, shall we? For our first story, we head to one of our favorite cities north of the border, Calgary, Alberta, where for over 30 years, one man has helped put a stamp on the world over by being a creator and innovator within an industry where character is everything. So the bell rings and we get everybody together, do a daily huddle. Yeah. Oh, we have an awesome team here. I'm Glenn Street. Uh, I'm top dog at Street Characters, Inc. We entertain the world, creating the absolute best mascots, period. Well, it's a long story. The Calgary Flames hockey team were moving into the Saddle Dome. A friend of mine went and pitched an idea to them and they said yes. And after they said yes, he realized he'd need some help. So he contacted me and he said, I pitched this idea, I need help, will you help me? And I said, sure, and we became business partners and we executed on this idea, which turned out to be the very first mascot in the National Hockey League and one of the first mascots in pro sports, a character named Harvey the Hound. And what happened was teams would come and play the Flames and a few days later, I'd always get a phone call hey, that's a great idea, can you do one for us? And the response was always, ah, no, we're just doing this for fun. We're Canadian boys, we get to go and see hockey. So finally in 87, we decided uh, to start making them for others. And 89, I bought him out. And here we are today, 31 years later. I performed as Harvey in, for about uh, eight years, till about 1992. And then actually I became game operations person for the Calgary Flames after that. It was great fun. We had uh, two Stanley Cup finals during that period that we got to participate in. One of them we won the Stanley Cup. Well, most teams would tell you they're not in the sports business, they're in the entertainment business. Teams have to make sure that they're creating something with a broad enough appeal that it will be of interest to people who maybe aren't real fans of the sport. You know, there's a number of reasons why the team should, should have a mascot. First of all, they can add to the entertainment uh, it, in stadium. They can build sponsorships around it. They can create whole game themes around their character. They can have the character out in the community. I actually spoke at the NHL marketing meetings a few years ago and talked about the Calgary Flames Harvey experience. And when I was done, one of the uh, VPs of the Flames stood up and said, you need to understand, even in hockey-mad Calgary, we can take our mascot and we can take our marquee player and we can send them down the street together and more people are going to know who our mascot is. I didn't grow up thinking, well, I'm going to start a mascot business. It was something that I fell into and, and you know, it was one of those things that People really had to push us to, to get started because the need was there. So we've been doing this uh, about 31 years now, and we've worked with about half the mascots in the NFL, NHL, Major League Baseball, whole ton of colleges down in the States, a few in the Spokane area. We have what we call the three keys to success. So you have to have the right costume, so it has to be lightweight, durable, easy to maintain, and safe, and the performer needs to be able to move in it. You need the right individual inside, and that's probably the most difficult piece to fill, and the organization has to be committed to making it work. If any one of those three things are missing, it's probably not going to be successful. One of the things that uh, is really interesting is a lot of teams particularly, when they approach us, they want this tough looking, fierce, don't mess with me looking character. 
And we do those. We'll do whatever the client wants, but we like to have the conversation with them around, think about your favorite character. It's probably a fun, cartoony type of character. It's not something that was a real realistic or fierce looking character. These characters become the host of the, in the arena for the fans. And the team really wants the fans to react positively to this character. They want the fans to embrace the character. And our experience is, is that when you do them kind of fun and light and things like that, that they're very approachable. You know, and a great example is the Calgary Flames here. You know, when we first rolled out Harvey, the Flames were sold out in season's tickets. Most of the season ticket holders were corporate seats. The majority of the people here were geologists and engineers. Um, and their average age was in the, in the 50s. So we had this older, highly educated, mostly adult, uh, white collar crowd. Exactly the kind of crowd you'd think a mascot would work in. Uh, yet every year when the Flames did their season ticket survey, they'd ask the question, other than the hockey, what's your most favorite thing at the Flames game? And consistently, 85 to 88 percent of the fans would say the mascot. And that's because we understood the crowd that we had and we played to that crowd. And uh, so anytime a whistle went, they were looking around to see where's the hound, what's he going to do next? He's a big part of the entertainment at the game. The mascot industry has changed a lot since Glenn started in 1987. Back then, most organizations weren't sure how to use a mascot. Today, they know exactly what they're doing. You might say they have it down to a science. For our next story, we stay in the world of entertainment, but return to Spokane. The Spokane Symphony has a long, proud history of bringing musical excellence to our region. Since 2004, maestro Eckhart Proy has been on the podium it's the beginning of Eckhart's final season in Spokane, and spending time with him off stage, we found a fun, good-natured guy who is serious about his music. When I step on the podium, I think the only thing that I'm really thinking about is sound. Particularly the first sound, because the first, the very first chord, or the very first sound that you produce, sets the tone for the rest of it. It, it has a very spiritual, a spiritual experience when you, uh, when you conduct and all that music comes out. And you have actually, when you're standing right in front of the orchestra, that sound is amazing. Maestro Eckhart Proy has served as music director of the Spokane Symphony since 2004. He is now in his final season. Right now, I'm really just focused on the new season and making it a great, musically satisfying season. Music has always been a central part of Eckhart's life, and it's brought him on a long and winding road from his childhood in communist East Germany to Spokane. I think that when you grow up in a society where you are always aware of the restraints, that you have to operate in, even as a child, um, that you sh it shapes your life in, in, very, in very different ways. Eckhart was born in 1969. His father was a musician who inspired Eckhart to pursue music. It was not so much a decision as just a very organic flow. When Eckhart was 10 years old, he and his brother were enrolled in boarding school at the Dresden Boys Choir, one of the world's oldest and most famous choirs of its kind. And pretty much all we did all day long was singing and soccer. I had two choices. Either I became a soccer player or I do something with music. And, and when you do music um, in boys choir, there was basically either you became a singer, 
I became a conductor. And my brother uh, was already a conductor, he's five years older, so it became very natural to me to just follow in his footsteps as a little brother who admired his big brother. The Dresden Boys Choir consisted of you know, 140 boys, and we were allowed to travel to West Germany, to Finland, to Spain, to Italy, to all these countries that East Germans were not allowed to travel. So that was, a, that was a, quite a privilege. At the Boys Choir, Eckhart became a soloist, rehearsal pianist, and assistant conductor. Later, in 1989, the Berlin Wall came down and Eckhart's world began to open up. After the wall came down, my first thought was, how can I get out of here? You know, um, Since I had been traveling before to Western countries, I had caught like the bug and I wanted to get out and I wanted to, to, to see the world. I thought, okay, the only way I can make this happen is if I study abroad. And so when I started studying conducting, I was always on the lookout for scholarships that would allow me to study abroad because I didn't have the money. I tracked down a scholarship uh, to go to France for two years and then I applied for a scholarship to come to the United States for, for a year. During those years, Eckhart became principal conductor for the New Amsterdam Symphony Orchestra in New York, as well as associate conductor for the Richmond Symphony in Virginia. And so three years into my uh, tenure as, a, as associate conductor in Richmond, I applied for uh, several positions in Stanford, Connecticut, and, and also here in, in Spokane. And then I became music director here. I didn't really know where Spokane was at the, at the time. I was looking at the map and said, oh my God, it's all, all the way up there on the, the far left corner. Um, and, uh, and I just knew it was cold. And then when I was here for the first time conducting the orchestra, I felt incredibly welcome. You know, I felt that musicians were very warm. It was a very good organization, uh, very, very positive. And I found that everybody in the community that I encountered was, was very, very, very friendly. And it's, and it's beautiful. And my experience in Spokane with the orchestra, but in Spokane in general, is that if you make a case for something, maybe may it be weird or funky or interesting or new, had never been done before, people will follow because Spokane is a very open uh, community and it's always ready for a new adventure. And then we're going to get this opportunity again, so I'm just going to go, so just smile. Thank you. You did good, you did good. Come on, the other way, the other way. Eckhart has led the symphony through some new adventures and some of its most historic moments, including the opening of its current home, the Martin Woldson Theater at the Fox. The opening of the Fox Theater, I think that was a game changer for the orchestra, musically, and I think also for the community, uh, for downtown Spokane. It was actually my predecessor, Fabio Macchetti, who said that, you know, a concert hall is an instrument. And that is so true. And I think that instrument really changed the way we play music in Spokane. I can feel, as a conductor, in my back, the energy that's, kind of, that's coming from the audience. I know what they're thinking. I know when they're bored. I know when they're sleeping. But I also know when they're excited about it. And so, and I think when you, uh, when you, when you, when you connect um, with the audience, and that's kind of, you know, it may, may sound funky, but I'm, but I'm German, so I mean it. It's, you know, this, this energy exchange that you, that you put out as an orchestra, when you have 100 people on stage and they play their hearts out, the audience will feel that and they will receive that. And then they kind of, they, uh, when they're engaged, they give it back. Spokane is also the place where Eckhart would meet Neely, his bride-to-be. Together, they're raising two daughters. When I was introduced as music director here in Spokane, the symphony put up billboards all over town, these, bill, these big uh, highway billboards, and uh, with my face on it, 
And, and the story goes that Neely saw those billboards with my face and said, I'm going to marry that guy. And the rest is history. I always wanted to have time, more time for my family. As a musician, you identify yourself very strongly with your, with your work. You know, because that's what I've been doing since I was four or three or so. I've done been just music, so th that's a very important part of me. But family is, is basically my anchor. And so what that does is it makes you a super, super, and all parents will agree, a super, super efficient person. Because you need to be. And so 10 years ago or so, I would have had you know, hours and hours of work and days I would have spent on a certain score. Now I can do it in a couple hours with almost more depth um, uh, because, because you just get so, so efficient. And your brain, I think, is also on a, dialed a little bit on a different level, your memory and, and, and your creativity also. It's like, you just, it's, it's like on, on overdrive, on, on, on creative overdrive in many ways. So you don't you know, develop concepts very slowly, but you're just like, like this, like this. And, and I enjoy that. I enjoy that. It's kind of, yes, I can do this, you know? It's a good thing that Eckhart enjoys being on Overdrive. He's already been splitting his conducting time between Spokane, Long Beach, California, and Cincinnati. After this season, he'll turn in his baton in Spokane to become music director for the Portland Symphony Orchestra in Maine. And if the first two are kind of abo-ish, so brrr, boom. Second time also, brrr, boom. And the third time is brrr, boom. So I've been music director here for 14 years. Uh, and I think the average tenure of a music director with an orchestra is six. Even so, Eckhart still considers Spokane to be his home base. And, and for the foreseeable future, uh, it might as well stay that way. My family is very happy here. I'm very happy here. Um, it's a beautiful community. So unless there's a real reason to move, um, I won't move. <laughs> I'm honored and humbled about being given a star. I've given 15 years of my life to this organization. And I think what that star symbolizes for me personally um, is that even though I'm leaving the Spokane Symphony, I'll be always right there. Thank you. I'm not really thinking about goodbyes yet, you know? I'm, um, because I think uh, that might just affect me in, in weird ways. I think, you know, I, I want to have a good time. I want everyone else to have a good time. I know that I had a really good run and that I had a great time here. Everything I know now as a music director, I learned here. And that's two measures before the woodwinds have tom, 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 pom, 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 pom. Yeah, you'll find your way back in. What keeps me in music is the search for something that will, I, I will never reach. That's the one, yeah, thank you. Every time you look at a piece, it's a, it's a new piece. And every time you look at a piece, you, you dig a little, little deeper. It's like this eternal tunnel, and you dig and you dig and you dig, no matter how long and how often you perform a piece, um, you find new things. And, um, and, and you may actually change your entire opinion about a, about a, about a piece, like this third or fourth or 10th time you do it, and say, I've always done it wrong, now I do it this way. Music is such a thing that is so alive, and every time you do it, it's different. And if you do this exact same piece with the same orchestra, it's already different. But when you do the same piece with a different orchestra, it becomes a whole different piece. And I like that. I like that part. In his rare downtime, Eckhart may occasionally enjoy a good, loud action movie, but more often than not, he relishes quiet. He's taken up golf where he can enjoy the quiet and closeness of nature at the golf course. I guess he hasn't played in my foursome. And speaking of nature, in 2009, a small group of lawyers found themselves fed up with polluters, abusing one of Spokane's most valuable resources, its river. They recognized a hands-on approach was needed to protect this cherished asset and formed a group known as the Spokane Riverkeeper. 
Yeah, I'm gonna go get my gear. Thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, Bill movies. Spokane Riverkeeper is an advocacy organization that prides itself on being an organization that has an on the river presence. We might patrol the river for various reasons. It could be a litter pickup day, which we do quite frequently throughout the summer. It could be looking at uh, combined sewer overflow pipes. It could just be a day to go out and freshen up our whitewater skills. Fall in the water unexpectedly, pop up, first thing I want to hear is your name because that tells me a lot. We get out into the community educating youth, sometimes on the river, sometimes in schools, about all kinds of issues that face our river. Toxics that run off of human use into the river, to land use and the way in which runoff pollutes rivers. This is called a secchi tube, and it doesn't really look that dirty now that we've taken the sample, right? But we're gonna see if it is. You know, when we go we're talk to here, youth, you know, they really get the need for clean water, and they really ask the right <laughs> questions. Let's talk about what a healthy stream is. We really want the students to get a feel for what is happening in their backyard. A lot of students didn't even know where Hangman was located, and so knowing that it's so close and it's so vital to their Spokane River, which they're all very familiar with, I found very important to introduce them to that, and, and hopefully they can spread the message so to other people who also aren't very familiar with our watershed that this is important and that we should care. I want to go forth and how I look at the river and how other people look at the river and change their perspectives and to show people that it's something that we're not dealing with now, we're going to have to deal with it for the rest of our lives. The way we are using and abusing our resources is not healthy for our environment and, and unless we get out here and have experiences like this and are able to change that. A lot of people don't realize, for instance, that there are dischargers discharging waste into the river. A lot of people don't realize that there are land uses up in the headwaters, like in the Palouse area, where waste runoff from farm fields and golf courses and other places get into the river. So we serve to call attention to those things, call them out, and then look for solutions. The Spokane River right now is a really interesting mixed story. It's gotten much, much cleaner since the 20th century when we were dumping raw sewage in, sawdust, and municipal garbage directly into the river. We don't do that anymore. We've also vastly increased the technology that we're using at wastewater treatment plants. That's cleaned the river up a great deal. The issue is, and we've got a lot of work to do, is we have a great deal of toxins that are now in our waste stream that might not have been 50 years ago. So polychlorinated biphenols, fire retardants, even cosmetics and microplastics are now posing an increased threat to the river, and we're gonna have to pay attention to that and do our level best to get those out of the lower Spokane, so below Monroe Street Dam, and they're looking at red band trout. Now I don't know what to talk about, but uh, hey guys, right. The thing is, is that yeah, laws were designed to clean our waters up. Studies on red band trout. We were supposed to have fishable, swimmable waters across the United States by 1987. In many places, things are getting better, but we're not there yet. So those laws really help to get us there, make progress, and they help to protect what we already have that's in good shape. The public often doesn't understand that laws can get run over if nobody's watching. And the public has 475 things to think about when they get up in the morning <laughs> and go off to work or school. So that's where we come in and we are really out here being the eyes and ears to make sure those laws are followed for the public's river. It is mind blowing to be out there and see how the farming right up to the edge of the creek. You know, no buffers, tons of sediment going into the stream. And, and that, the pollution from Hangman Creek pollutes the Spokane River for sometimes 50 miles downstream. 
One of the things we're quite proud of is actually bringing the attention of the public to their river. The public now is beginning to really recognize when they see that muddy plume coming out of the mouth of Hangman Creek, it's not just natural normal erosion, it's pollution. It's actually the community that really inspires me every day when I get up and go out and work. And so when you're involved in outreaching to the public, whether it's the youth or maybe it's boaters or maybe it's people walking their dogs on the Centennial Trail above the river, at some fundamental level, the public really does love their river and understand it. And that's absolutely what keeps River Keeper getting up and going out day after day, sometimes to roll our sleeves up and find resistance inside the bureaucracies. We keep doing it because the public does care and the public gets it. More recently, the Spokane River Keeper has been working closely with Spokane Falls Trout Unlimited conducting research to find ways to restore the river's red trout population and enhance the overall fishability of the river system. And with that, it's time to let you off the hook. We've reached the end of this edition of Northwest Profiles. If you're looking to find out more about any of the stories you've just seen or to give us a story idea, simply go online to ksps.org. Until next time, this is Lynn Valtry saying so long. And remember, the beauty of living in the inland Northwest and Western Canada is the fact that there's adventure around every corner. So get out there and explore, and when you do, make sure you take time to enjoy the view.